Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. I love the, the fact that the Bible is so relevant. It has so many um, illustrations that it gives us about our personal life. I mean, you take the scripture like when Paul's saying that each and every single one of us are in a race and there's, there's, there's a, 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 a fact that we are to keep the eye on the prize and, and there's a finish line on this race. And, and though many of us sometimes in life we want to change lanes, but how many know that the finish line always stays the same? So some of us have maybe fallen and we put this grand focus on the fall, but it's not how you start. It's how you're going to finish this race between you and God. And I love, I love the video of the guy that was, the, the, the guy who, who uh, is the African-American guy who falls. And then, but before he starts, he was like this and like this. Everybody go like this and go like this. And, and he, it's almost like he's saying, focus, focus, focus. And then he's like, okay, God, we got this. Ready, ready, ready. And so many of us live that way. We're like, we start like this. And we are like, it's all about him. But then along the way, every single one of us come to a place in our life where we fall. And the Bible says that though a man may fall seven times, he will what? He'll rise again. And, and the, the challenge of rising again is not really a, an outer issue, an outer problem. It's an internal issue. It's a mind issue. The mind is always going to keep you in a place of not getting back up. Your mind is going to tell you, you can't, you won't, it will never. And then we just kind of live there and we stay there on the ground. But as we see these different sport figures that when they have fallen, it's embarrassing when you fall. Have you ever fallen? I remember in school, there's been times where I have like tripped and fell. And then you pretend like you meant to do that. And then you pretend you're tying your shoe or you're stretching. And, and the reason we do that is because we really don't want to be the parade where people are actually looking at us and then we feel this, this shame and, and this kind of, this feeling of like, how stupid am I? But you know what? That's what the devil does to us. He puts this condemnation on you when you fall. He puts this shame on you, this guilt trip, and it keeps you from running the race that God has already designed for you. And um, I don't know about you, but you guys been watching the Dodger game? I'm not a baseball fan. But because it's the World Series, I'm watching it. And because it's in L.A., L.A. Dodgers, I'm watching it. And I was watching the game where they're already losing. It's two to, to, to zero. And they, they come in that, 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 what was it, 18 innings? Something crazy like that. What was it, like seven hours and change? I'm thinking, well, I got tired. By 12 o'clock, I turned it on. I'm like, forget that. I'll, I'll look at the news tomorrow. But, uh, but it was pretty wild because for 18 innings, it was like this emotional roller coaster. It's like they fall, but they get back up, and then they fall. Then they get back up, we're going to take it, and then they fall. And then it's just like, oh, my God, are we going to win this? Are we going to lose this? Anyone feel that way? Like, man, are we going to take this or what? And for, for a moment, I'm thinking, man, we suck. We're just going to lose. You know, I felt that way. I was just being honest. But the reality was that, man, the Dodgers, they put a fight, man. They, they played the game. They persevered. They, it was a mind game the whole night. And it messes with your emotions and how you feel and how you see. But obviously we know that, uh, what's that guy's name? I'm not a baseball guy. The guy with the big red beard. He's a pretty cool guy. Turner. Turner, man. Turner brought it, huh, man? Just wham. And he got the, the grand slam and boom, we won it, right? But then what happened yesterday? I watched it yesterday. I'm thinking, okay, they came in. They were ready. Praise the Lord. And they get in there and they hit, what was it, four runs? They hit four runs. And you know what happened? My personal opinion as I was watching the game, I personally think they got comfortable. After the four, they were like celebrating and just as if they already won. They just took the whole game like, that's it, Boston. You can go home now. We got this. And they celebrated too soon. And what happens is sometimes in life, life can be going so good for you. Marriage can be going good. Business can be going good. Work could be going good. Friendships can be going good. And you can get so comfortable and not realize that, man, there is a loss about to come because it's so easy to get comfortable and stop winning. It's not an either or, but it's, it's how do I, when I'm losing, how do I persevere? And when I'm winning, how do I reach for more? 
How, how do I stir the heart up? How do I believe God for just a little bit more? Not just enough to, to get by, not just enough to, to bless my family, but how do, I, how do I reach for more of God beyond just being so comfortable? I think when you're comfortable with your Christian walk, that's when casualties happen, honestly. I love the story of the football guy, uh, Frank Wright, and, uh, and, and there's, uh, there's the whole story. The way it goes was he... They were losing, the Bills were losing like 3 to 33. And this was a game that was just going south. And all of a sudden, you have um, the coach decides to take out the MVP quarterback player, pulls him out, says, you know what, let's put in the rookie. They put in the rookie. They're already thinking, we lost this already. Who, who cares? Let's just make sure that we don't get our MVP guy get injured and go through all kinds of, you know, pain and suffering. And so let's put in the new guy, the rookie. They put him in. The rookie goes ahead and he wins the game for them, which was pretty amazing. Go for, it was like historical from 3 to 33 and, and wins the, the Super Bowl. They interview him and they ask him, how did you feel when you were placed in a position like that, when you guys are just completely flat out losing and all of a sudden, man, you get this win. And uh, his response was very simple. He said, you know what? It's never too late to quit. And I really believe that's what God is saying to every single one of us, that it's never too late to quit. It's never too late to get back up. It's never too late to quit. As a matter of fact, if we look in the Bibles, I want you to go with me real quick to Ecclesiastes chapter. Open up my notes here. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter three. Look at this. There are 28 seasons in our life that God speaks about. And I think as we read this, you're going to realize like, man, yeah, I've experienced that. Yeah, I've experienced that. I've experienced that. So there's no season under the sun that we haven't, that, that God isn't aware of. Look at this. 28 seasons in our life. Look, he says, there's a time to be born, but there's also a time to die. There's a time to plant and there's a time to pull up what is planted. There is a time to kill and there is a time to heal. There's a time to, to tear down and there's a time to build up. There's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. There is a time to be sad and there's a time to dance. There is a time to scatter stones and there's a time to gather them. There is a time to embrace someone. There's also a time to, uh, to not embrace. There's a time to search and there's a time to stop searching. There's a time to keep and there's a time to throw away. There is a time to tear, and there's a time to mend. There's a time to be silent, but there's also time to speak. There's a time to love, but there's also a time to hate. There's a time for war, but there's also a time for peace. And how many can actually look at life and say, you know what? Man, I think God knows what he's talking about. But notice that in every single verse in the time that he spoke of, the the only thing, there, he said there's a time for everything, but there's never a time to quit. Nowhere in the verses do you see, and there's a time to give up, and there's a time to quit, and there's a time to throw in the towel. There is no time for you to quit, give up, throw in the towel. There's only a time for us to get back up again. And I don't know where you're at right now. Maybe you feel like, man, I have had so many setbacks, setbacks financially, setbacks in family, setbacks in relationships, sex, setbacks in my health. I don't know what setbacks you've had or, or what you feel that you may be in right now, the season of just depression, oppression. How many know that a lot of that is just, it's, it's, it's a torment in the mind. It starts with a personal decision, one deciding to Get up in the midst of it. I mean, if you want to talk about the, 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 the most incredible, amazing comeback, I mean, let's look at just the story of Jesus. What a comeback that one was, huh? Think about it. Satan and all his demons are looking at the Savior of the world, the one who would pay for all our sins. And, and he hears the very words of Jesus when he says, it is what? It is finished. And I'm sure Satan was probably standing there like, oh, yeah, you know you're finished. Oh, yeah, you are finished. And we know that once he said those last words, they went ahead and they took him and they placed him in the tomb. And they said, you are done. He is finished. Can you imagine what that party in hell looked like? Man, they're all just like, you know, bumping their jams and, you know, they're just doing their thing. And then Jesus walks in and says, what's up? <laughs> just imagine. Just, I mean, they heard the words. It is finished. And they're like, we agree with you, Jesus. It is finished. No. What was finished was that he finished, he destroyed every single work of the devil. The devil should have paid more attention. And so Jesus shows up on the scene, 
And then he, he goes ahead and he steals. He takes the keys from Satan that he took from him. And he unlocks the prison doors of our hearts. And he says, and whom the sun sets free is what is free indeed. But what do we do? We get back into bondage because we allow the shame, the guilt, the condemnation to keep us there. And then we stay there on the floor forever. And then we don't get up. It's a choice for you to get up. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to get up. Joel 2.25 says this, so I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. And I don't know, I believe that there are people here in this church, like in every church, where, man, there have been years and years where you have just been living in oppression, living in depression. And I know that stuff is real, anxiety, all those things are real. But they can't be so much more real than the God who wants to deliver you, heal you, restore you, redeem you. Come on, so many, so many of us, we've just been laying there for years. And, and, and if you want to be sad, if you want to stay oppressed, if you want to stay depressed, you know what? God wants to heal. How many believe that God wants to heal? But, but, but God, God gives you the choice as well. It's amazing how many of us, we, we, we believe that, that God can do so many amazing things, but how many know that it, it comes with a choice, it comes with a decision, it comes with a responsibility. That means that I have to do my part. Faith without works is dead. There's something about me that I got to do. I got to get up even when I'm not feeling. Some of you came to church today. You weren't feeling like going to church. You weren't feeling like God, but you showed up. That's what God needs. God needs people with perseverance. And when you do that, listen, you take five steps, God takes 10 steps. You take 20 steps, God takes 50 steps. But God's just waiting for people to get up. Just come up, get up, rise up. And that's what's happening today. So he says, I will restore. Who will restore? God will restore. I will restore the years that the locust has in. I will restore whatever the enemy came to steal from you. I will restore joy to you. I will restore peace to you. I will restore health to you. I'll tell you this much. When I went through that whole issue with this Hodgkin's lymphoma, this smash in between my heart and my breastplate, man, I'll tell you, I lost one year of my life, one whole year. I was in and out of hospitals. I was going to City Hope for one year, man. I had blood drawn out of my body so many times and and I, I literally felt like man one whole year of my life I felt like I just lost that age and it was when I turned gosh how old was I I think I turned I was like 30 30 years old 30 years old I lost my whole 30th year and uh, but how many know that that God restores the years that the so I feel like I've done more in the last 12 13 years than I have in the former years God says I will allow you to see even greater things than your former years. And it's been awesome. I love it. I'm not ready for better things. He'll restore it. But check this out. The only way that failure can get the last word in our life is if we choose to let it. That's the only way. Because I know that many of us have, 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 have had some failures and, and we've had some mistakes in our life, poor choices. But how many know that just because you had a failure doesn't mean that you are a failure. Just because you made a mistake doesn't mean that you are a mistake. God has a comeback for every single person that desires it, but that comeback comes with a responsibility. It comes with you making a decision and a choice to want the comeback. Amen? And you're probably thinking, well, I don't need a comeback. I'm right here. But you know what? It's, it's interesting because you and I can be in the house of God Come on, we can have lip service, but our heart be far from him. It's so easy to be at a place where, where we lose in life. And I know that many of us, we, we think of maybe tangible things we lost, but I want to go just a little bit more deeper. I mean, some of us here maybe have lost our passion for people, have lost our passion for Christ, have lost our passion for souls. Man, there are people here that have lost the dream in their heart. I know that there are people that God has shown them big things and, and life happened and, and they've just been laying there forever. I know wonderful people with great potential. I'm, I'm talking like phenomenal potential, more intelligent than me, just so much more gifted than me. But I see that in life something happened and they just, they're still laying there. 5, 10, 50, I've been saved for 22 years. There are people that should be further than I am right now. But you know what? It's not that they lack potential. It's that they won't choose to get up. The dream inside them is still there inside. How, how many are glad that God, God God's, God's calling is irrevocable. God doesn't change his mind about you. God still wants to do it. God still still wants to bless you. God still wants to do awesome things, but we have a decision to make at the end of the day. I'm telling you. Or maybe you've lost your way. 
Maybe you're here and you've just lost your way. You just don't feel like, man, I'm not, this, not the same, that same man of God I used to be. I'm not that same woman of God I used to be. You've lost your way about how, how you serve God, how you worship God. You lost your way in your generosity. You've lost your way. There was a time where, man, your way was right before God. You even know, listen, you know when you're off and you know when you're right. I mean, no one has to tell you, hey, you're off. Every single person here knows in their own heart when they've lost their way. Or maybe you've lost your prayer life. Maybe you stopped praying for a while. Maybe you've stopped praying for a week, a month, a year. Maybe you've left that. Maybe you've lost your word life. Because there's the prayer life, but then there's the word life as well, right? I know if you were to ask someone, hey, man, uh, do you have a prayer life? They'd be like, well, I have an internet life. I have an Instagram life. I have a Facebook life. I have a Netflix life. Hey, I even have an Amazon life. I love being on Amazon. But you talk about the prayer life, and there's no prayer life. We can talk about all kinds of other lives, but the prayer life is something that it's so easy to be in church and just completely have no connection with God. That's the only way to stay in, in, in intimacy with God is only through prayer life, through word and prayer. Come on, maybe you're here today and you're thinking, man, I just, I just I've, I've lost my joy. I have no joy. Well, you know what? The only way to get your joy back is to praise God. And I know many of us just wait, okay, when God does it, when God answers my health issue, then I'm going to have joy. I can already see it. And Pastor, I can, see, I can see me jumping up and down. But you know what God says? Read the scriptures. Every single time that God defeated his enemies for Israel, he always sent out who? The worshipers, the praisers. Right before any victory, before any of the Philistines or any of the, the hepatites, the, <laughs> all the ites were destroyed, the praisers always went out. It was never the victory before the praise. It was always the praise, then you got the victory. It starts with the praise. It starts with that worship. You know what, maybe right now you're not feeling well. Praise him. Maybe right now your kids are, are far off from God. They're doing crazy stuff. You praise him. Well, how's that going to change anything? Well, how, how, is it going to, how is it going to feel to keep staying in the same place with your face on the ground? Not, you might as well just start praising because praising moves mountains. Man, I'll tell you, it moves the hand of God. More, more than the hand of God, it moves the heart of God. When he can find someone in church that just doesn't have anything going on, and, but that, yet they're still lifting their hands. They're still praising their God. They're still shouting. They're not losing their shout. Come on, if everybody stops shouting, would you stop shouting or would you shout all the more? Come on, we give people permission to praise when you don't hold back. But when you're holding back your praise, when you're holding back your shout, man, you're basically telling people, don't, you know what, you can just be like me. Oh, we got to shout all the more. Man, we got to praise God. I'll never forget being in the hospital and, and, and the nurses would walk in, how are you feeling today? And I wasn't feeling great. But, you know, I, I would tell them just to convince me it wasn't for them. You know, my praise is not for people. My praise is for my God. And they'd be like, well, how, how are you feeling, uh, Mauricio, today? How are you feeling? I'm like, you know what? I, I, I'm, 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 I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm going to come out of this. And I'll never forget the nurse right before my major surgery of like 20 plus hours. She said, if you're so good, then why are you here? You see, listen, people may not understand. People may not relate. But I know what it means to me. When I praise my God, I know my God is going to get me out of this situation. You cannot lose your praise. Amen. Can we give God a big shout of praise? Amen. Come on. I'm not, I'm, not say, I'm not saying a Dodger praise. I'm talking about God, a God praise right now. Ready? A God praise. Ready? One, two, three. Come on. Bless you, Lord. Yeah, you know, I have, lear I have learned that when I've, I've come to those places, and, and every single one of you have been to that place where, where, where we've, we've, we've left something somewhere that we lost. For example, do you remember David? David, if you read the book of Psalms, David was, was known to be a psalmist, a worshiper. And, and David had this, this, this gift of being able to write music. You read all throughout the book of Psalms, and, and a lot of those, those, those chapters we're reading, they're, they're, they're songs to the Lord. They're not just meant to be read. They're songs. And, and so David would write songs. But what happened was David ended up leaving the ark, and everywhere David went, the ark went with him. In other words, the presence of God went with him everywhere. And so David ends up leaving the ark 
with um, some guy named uh, Obadiah, and he leaves it at his house, but then he kind of loses it. And for 18 months, man, he is away, just kind of just living life. And for 18 months, he didn't write one song for 18 months. That's like some of us. You know what? We can be out on the field. We can be out in the battle and not realize that the presence of God has left you. And so he's out there, and he has no presence of God, which means he has no music from God, which means he stops writing. And so many of us, sometimes we start doing things in our own natural gifting, our natural talents. Come on, we start paying for things in our own natural resources. But you can come to a place where you don't even sense or even feel the presence of God because you made it about other things other than the presence. David already understood that, man, wherever he went, whenever he wrote, he felt the presence of God. Man, he wrote songs that were just uplifting. He also talked about his vulnerabilities. But, man, after every vulnerability, about after he would say how horrible it is, he'd always come back, but with a, but God. And I will praise him on the streets, and I will dance before the Lord. Hey, man, he was so free that the brother would take off his clothes and dance naked before everybody. He didn't care. Talk about freedom. But you know, but when you lose the ark of God, when you lose the presence of God, you lose the shout of God. You, 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 you had a moment in life where, man, I remember when I used to have faith to move mountains. Now all you do is talk about the mountains. I remember a time, man, when, when whenever, you know, uh, the church would rally up people to go and, and reach people and save people. Man, I was the first one out there to go invite someone to, to church, uh, bring someone to Christ, uh, uh, serve someone in, in the community. Man, pay for someone's meal at a restaurant. And then we just kind of lose our way after a while. For 18 months, David, the worshiper, the praiser. Stop doing all that for 18 full months. But look what happens. Once he realized that, man, this, this life is dry. Come on, David said, I, I need a comeback. Look at, look at uh, 2 Samuel. I think it's uh, 2 Samuel 6. It says, David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord. So they brought the ark back. And it says, and they were singing songs, and they were playing all kinds of musical instruments, the lyres, the harps, the tambourines, the castanets, and the cymbals, and they were just praising God. Maybe you're here and you're saying, you know what, I've lost my song. I've, I've, I've just, I've, I've lost my way. I, I remember when my song meant something to me. Now I just sing words. There's no depth to my song for God. There's no depth to my intimacy with God. It's just, it's just routine. It's the church thing. I, I go to church. I hear a message. I, I sing a few songs. I lift my hands when the worship leader says, lift your hands, and I lift them like this, and, and I don't even know what that means to me anymore. There's, there's, it's almost like, it's like we lose this, this, this fear of God. Come on, when there's no fear of God, there's no smile of God. God wants to smile on his people, but there's got to be a reverence for this place. The perfect example was Samuel. Samuel started strong. We know that Samuel was known for his strength. God simply told Samuel, hey, Samuel, uh, whatever you do, don't, don't, let, don't let anyone, including yourself, chop off the seven locks on your head. Okay? So he had a nice, you know, set of hair. And, and so he's, he's, he's living his life, and every day he's putting a whoop on the enemy. The Philistines come, he puts a whoop on them. Nobody can take him down. He's the strongest man on earth. And this woman walks in and starts messing with him. And obviously, the end of the story is that, you know what, he falls into her trap. And uh, she, she finds a way to find out the secret sauce of his strength, which was the locks and his obedience tied into the locks. The locks get cut off. He wakes up one morning. She wakes him up and says, the enemy's coming. The enemy's coming. He walks out there thinking, I got this. But the Bible says this, the Bible says this, and when he went out to battle, he, he, he did not realize that the presence of the Lord was no longer with him. And we can be, listen, we can be in church and no longer has, have his presence. We can be sitting every single Sunday in church and, and not have the presence of God in our life. Not because he took his presence from you, but because we left his presence. Amen? And then we become religious people. And then we just do the church stuff. Well, so here's the beautiful thing. Aren't you glad that God gives every single one of us grace and mercy to come back? Even if it was your fault, even if you missed it, 
God will show you grace. And we know that the story of Samson, he started praying to God, God, just give me one more chance. Just give me one more comeback. Come on. I know I messed up. I missed it. I failed. Man, it was my mistake. I, it was my sin. And, and you know what happened? The Bible says that. See, that's what I love about the scriptures. The enemy is so stupid. The enemy has been stupid since the beginning. Let me tell you why. When, when, when Jesus did the whole surprise, okay, what was the enemy doing? Man, they were parting it up. Man, Sam was like, we got them. You're never coming now. You're staying. You're done. But Jesus walks in and says, what? <laughs> Samson. The Bible says that the enemy literally plucked out his eyes. He had no eyes. You know why? You know what that says to me? The, the enemy always comes for the vision. Why? Because we're, we're the kind of people that always want to see the goodness of God. We want to see the blessing of God. We want to see the dream of God. We want to see the mercy. We want to see. So what does the enemy do in the story? He takes the little, the, the vision away. But, but, but this is where the enemy fails. So the enemy is parting it up, right? Read the Bible. They're all having a party, literally a party. And that's the, that's the thing. The enemy is so stupid, he doesn't pay attention. He should have paid attention when Jesus was in the tomb. And the enemy should have paid attention when Samson was on his knees calling out to his God, asking for a comeback. Because the Bible says that little by little by little, his hair began to grow back. See, these knuckleheads, they're pardoning out. We got you. We got you. Samson's repenting. He's turning it around. He's getting the conviction back in his life. He's getting the reverence and the fear of God back in his life. He's seeking God. He's asking God, just let me finish what you started in me. See, it's not how we started, it's how we finish. And what happens? The hair starts growing back, and then Samson regains his strength. Why did, he, why did he regain his strength? Because he regained the presence of God in his life. The presence of God came back in, and when the presence of God comes in, you'll do supernatural things, man. Yeah, you can do some stuff in your own strength. Yeah, you can do some, some stuff with your own talents and your giftings. Yeah, you can do some stuff with your money. And let me tell you something. There's not enough money. There's not enough talent. There's not enough gifting. Man, there's not enough house. There's not enough car. Man, there's not enough anything out there that can fulfill me the way God can fulfill you with purpose, with life, with vision, with dream. Man, look at Kurt and Holly. You know, when... I've known Kurt for how many years now, Kurt? 15. 15 years. I've known him when he was at his lowest point. And I would speak life to him and, and encourage him and empower him. And he was going through some major family stuff. But God redeemed him, restored the years that he lost. And look, here he is married and, and with Holly and, and all kinds of wonderful things. And they've been in our marriage group. We've had over, over how many couples go through Elevate Marriage uh, Group? Over 100 couples already go through that in just in the matter of two years. And it's been awesome because here they are today. They're, they're giving their little book away. Okay, there's the alert. Praise Jesus. Put your phone on mute. <laughs> and, and it's awesome to see how, how God will give anyone who is willing and ready a comeback in a whole new level. What you thought was great then, God says, you know what, that's, that's nothing. Wait till you see what I can do with you. Now that you're out of the way, let's do something together. And so Samson, he regains his strength and he tears up the pillars of the, of the, of the, the room. And, and, and the Bible says that everything came crushing down on the enemy. And of course, yeah, Samson, he went down too, but he went down with joy. It wasn't how we started. It, it was about how we finished. He finished strong. One more story. The prodigal son. We've read that story a bazillion times. And there's just so much richness in that story. Here's why. In the story of the prodigal son, we know that he goes to his father and he says, Dad, give me what belongs to me. And if you really read the Bible and this, these stories, God is basically talking about you and me, the church. The church represents his house, and we know that we have a heavenly father. And so Jesus gives this parable, and the son says, give me what's mine, the father being that that loving father that he is says, all right, here, you know, son, it didn't have to be this way. He's like, no, give me what's mine. Like so many of us, God's like, it doesn't have to be this way. But because of our arrogance sometimes, because of our, our selfishness, our self-absorbedness, and all the things that we do, that me, me, me generation is just about me, God's like, okay, I'll, I'll let you have your way. And he gave it, 
give him all the inheritance. You know what he does? Man, the kid, the prodigal son, he goes out and he parties it up and he's at the bar and he's paying for everybody's drinks. And man, he's popular. Come on. He's paying for popularity. Listen, you may not be paying for popularity, but sometimes, if not careful, we're looking for likes and followers on Instagram all day long. And you're just looking for the validation of man when you already have the validation of Almighty God. And he's right there, right there, buying it up. But then you know what happens? Just like happens to us, after a while, you get wasted. You get tired. Man, he got wasted. He wasted all his money. He wasted all his inheritance. He wasted everything. Now what? Nobody wants him. So where does he find himself? You read the Bible. The Bible says that he was lying flat face in the, in the mud in the pig pen. I mean, you can't fall any lower than the pig pen and the mud. You can't go lower than that. And he'll, so his face is on the ground. And he just right there just feels the mud. But he started thinking. The Bible says this. Look, look at the scripture here in Luke chapter 15. It says, and when he came to his senses. Everybody say senses. Some of us need to come to our senses. You don't have to be in deep sin to be far away from God. Come on. You, you may have lost your way and your love for God. But you can come back to your senses. And so it says, and when he came back to his senses, when he started reflecting and thinking about, wow, you know, when I was with my father, man, that was the place where God provided for me, where my father provided for me, where my father accepted me, where my father loved me. It was the place where, where my father had a plan for me and he had a future. He had an inheritance ready for me. But, but sometimes, you know what, if you're not careful, you can do something too soon and not be ready and and that's scary because when you step out of out of God's step man now you're out of step and you can be in some serious trouble you got to stay in step in tune with God because when you do that you're going to see his blessing when you do it your way you're going to see what you can produce but with God we can produce some amazing supernatural things and so he says he came to his senses he started thinking about how he got out of step and he said how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare so he's starving He's starving. This story obviously talks about he's starving physically, right? But I think some of us, we're starving emotionally. We're starving from love or for love. We're starving for, for water. We're starving for the only one who can refresh us is Jesus. And he says, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and what? Go back. I will set out and have a comeback. I will set out and go back to my what? Father. Who do we go back to? Who do we go back to? Father. Go back to the Father. And we'll go back to the Father and I'll say to him, see, there's that repentance heart. He, he, he assessed his, his issue, his problem. He addressed it. And now he's on his way to progress. Assess your life. Address your life in order for you to progress your life with God. And so he, he says, man, uh, I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. Isn't it interesting that he brings up heaven in the picture too? So he repents for sinning against heaven. You know why? Because in heaven you and I have angels. Man, you want to talk about a stadium, you want to talk about arenas, you want to talk about sports. All the angels of heaven are cheering you and I on saying, Lauren, keep going. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going. Get up. But I fell. Get back up. Though a man or woman may fall seven times, he or she can rise again. Why? Because of the righteousness of God. Not because of your righteousness. You don't have enough righteousness. I don't have enough righteousness. But he is all righteousness. And because of his righteousness, I can get back up. And I can keep running. And look, and I've sinned against heaven. But I've also sinned against you, God. I'm no longer worthy. And isn't that the truth that many of us know people, or maybe some of you are here today with that heart, that you don't feel you're worthy. So many of us think that we need to be good to get God, but guess what? You just need God in order to be good. Without God, you'll never be good. There's not enough good in you that you can do to get God in your life. You can't even pay the price. God is good. We're not. And it's because of his goodness that we experience his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. But it goes on to sin. He says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He said, make me like one of your hired servants. Some of us have that attitude right now. You know, God, I'll give you my life back. 
I'll, I'll give you my heart back, but just, you don't, you don't have to fulfill the promises you said about me. I, I, I know I'm not worthy of it. I know I don't deserve it. But how many know that that's not the way God thinks? He doesn't think like you or me. <laughs> we feel unworthy. God says, you're worthy because I'm worthy. And he says, and he threw his arms around him. And he did what? Oh, let me, let me read the top. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And look at this. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. Here's the cool thing. It doesn't say that the prodigal son ran to the father. It says the father ran to the son. God's just looking for you to do this. Come back. When you turn, what, what's repentance? Repentance is simply change the direction you've been going and go back to him. That's it. That's your comeback. And you know, we know that the story says that he came back to the father's house. Because in the father's house is where you find God's blessing. In the father's house is where you find God's dream and vision for your life. In the father's house is where you find divine purpose for your life. In the father's house is where you get clarity of what he wants for your life and what he wants to do through your life. And, he wants, and what, who he wants to place in your life. It's through the father's house. And he comes and then the father loved him so much and he had so much compassion that when he, he literally, the father ran to him and threw his arms around him just just. Boom. Can you imagine what that looked like? For Jesus to describe the love of the Father, that the Father wants to embrace you, and he wants to give you a big old kiss, just kiss you and tell you, it's all good. I believe that God wants to just fall on people. He wants his peace to fall on you again. He wants his forgiveness to fall on you again. He wants his, his purpose for your life to fall on you again. He wants you to fall in love with him again. Once again. You can be in the Father's house, but you can have a prodigal son heart. And we know the whole story of the brother. He was with the Father, yet he was far from the Father. He was bitter, resentful, angry, jealous. You can be in church, be bitter, resentful, angry, jealous. And we become no different than the prodigal son that was a heathen, who was wasteful, who was out drugging it up, drinking it up. They're in the church, and there's outside of the church. The only thing God wants is a son and daughter to, to turn it around and come back to the Father. And the Father will embrace you. Amen. Stand to your feet. Let me pray for you. I want us to pray just just for God to do us something refreshing in us today. That we would respond to God today. That we would make the personal decision to, to engage our heart back with him. And you may say, you know what, I think I'm pretty good. I read my Bible, Pastor. Well, how many know that, that, that beyond just reading the Bible, God wants to reveal something new to you? You know, beyond just, yeah, why well, pray to God? Well, I'm not talking about just talking to God, but that, but that there'd be a dialogue where that you can actually hear whether it's the voice of God audibly or, or whether it's, it's reading the word and, and the scriptures start jumping out on you, that there would be this reigniting of passion and excitement and zeal for God. And not just, and not just go be churchgoers and be labeled churchgoers and, and be labeled Christians. No, that we would be labeled followers of Jesus every day of our life, that we wouldn't just have moments with God, but that we would have a lifestyle of all of God. Amen? Come on, some of us, we need to come back to that place of joy. And how do I come back to joy? I praise him. Praise him when it's, that's the best time to praise when everything is falling apart. Just shout, Jesus, and you see what God does. God's just waiting for you and I to come and just say, Father, renew my spirit. Renew a steadfast heart inside of me, God, that I may worship you and love you and be completely consumed with you and not my fall. Come on, what, what, where have you fallen? Where, where did you leave? Where did you last leave your worship? Where did you last leave your prayer life? Where did you last, and you know what you do? You go back and you, you, you become like David. Go back and you pick up that ark and, and you bring that back into your life. You bring the presence of God back in your life and you watch that God's gonna place a new song inside of you. 
Man, there's going to be a new shout, a new song. Man, there's going to be a new step. When you worship, you'll never worship the same, but it starts with you. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.